Be sure to check out Rob Plays. There you can hang out with me while we play video games and talk about life stuff. So what I want to do here is have a discussion about Diana Prince, better known as Wonder Woman. And what I'm hoping is that at the end of this video, you'll have a strong understanding of her character, as well as why she's proven to be such an important and popular character in DC Comics. So Wonder Woman first appeared in All-Star Comics number 8 in December of 1941 and was created by psychologist William Moulton Marston alongside artist H.G. Peter. Originally existing as a title owned by All-American Publications, because All-American had been absorbed into National Allied Publications prior to its renaming to DC Comics, National looked to maintain the existing All-American reader base while incorporating its own brand of superhero fare. Keeping the All-Star Comics brand and looking to William Marston, who considered comics to be a source of education due to their popularity among children, the creation of Wonder Woman came by way of Marston's wife Elizabeth. Covered in the 2001 fall issue of Bostonia, a magazine produced by Boston University's Alumni Association covering the events around campus and the relationship to the school's mission statement, where Marston had looked to create a superhero based on compassion rather than brute force, his wife's suggestion of making the hero a woman resonated with both Marston himself and DC Comics, who looked to tap into female readership in the post-first wave feminist era. Looking to the educational component of comics, Marston's initial design saw Wonder Woman rooted in the realm of Greek gods and goddesses, as well as storylines that helped readers to learn the difference between right and wrong, a trait hailing from the Amazonian culture of her comics, which emphasized strength and self-reliance. However, where Wonder Woman was designed to be a symbol of feminism, the early publications of her character included concepts of subservience, which included the loss of her powers if a man were to put chains on her. While I haven't been able to find a source as to why this particular weakness was included, these weaknesses, combined with the fact that Wonder Woman was physically modeled after pinup girls at the time, but maintained the same strength and capabilities of Superman, resulted in both critics and fans not really being able to understand how to deal with her. But regardless of these varying receptions, Wonder Woman's first origin established her as Princess Diana of Themyscira of the Amazonian tribe on Paradise Island. Encountering U.S. Army intelligence pilot Steve Trevor following a plane crash during his search for a Nazi spy, Diana nursed him back to health and slowly began to fall in love with him. However, this becomes a source of contention in that the Amazons are an all-female tribe and men are not allowed to stay on Paradise Island. As a result, Wonder Woman's mother Hippolyta, who also stands as queen of the tribe, declares that Steve Trevor must return to the United States once he's recovered. Realizing the basis behind his arrival, however, Wonder Woman's comics began to tie into World War II by way of Diana being sent back to America alongside Steve Trevor to aid in the conflict. As a result, Wonder Woman donned a pro-patriotic costume of Stars and Stripes fighting against the Axis powers. Now following these appearances in All-Star Comics, because Wonder Woman's popularity fell in line with DC's first generation heroes during the World War II era, much like those around her, Wonder Woman received her own self-titled solo series in July of 1942 under the writing of William Marston. Continuing the themes of pro-feminist ideas combined with educational content, the origin of Diana was expanded to include an explanation of the Amazons and Diana herself. As it was originally stated, the Amazons had been created around 1200 BC as a tribe made up exclusively of women who had been created when Greek gods and goddesses drew forth the souls of women who had died at the hands of men. Conversely, when Diana was born in the 20th century, because the Mascara existed absent men, her arrival came by way of Queen Hippolyta being told to mold a chunk of clay into the shape of a baby girl, after which the soul of an unborn baby that had been inside the woman who was reincarnated as Queen Hippolyta was put into the clay baby, coming to life as Diana. Following this, and in order to give her everything that she would need to become a warrior, six Greek gods and goddesses offered Diana gifts. Athena gave wisdom and courage, Demeter gave her strength, Artemis gave Diana hunting skills and the ability to communicate with animals, Hestia gave her sisterhood with fire, Hermes gave her powers of flight and speed, and Aphrodite gave her beauty and a loving heart. Finally, Diana was gifted the lasso of truth forged by the god Hephaestus, allowing her to force those ensnared to reveal the truth when speaking. In spite of all these gifts and talents, however, Diana was not originally a superheroine as we know her. Instead, where All-Star Comics depicted her arriving and immediately fighting Nazis, her solo series provided a wholesale recreation which revealed that Diana's initial foray into the United States saw her completely naive and lost. At the same time, instead of battling Nazis, Diana had taken her name from an existing woman named Diana Prince, with Wonder Woman herself working as a nurse where she encounters and falls in love with Steve Trevor. However, following William Marston's death in 1947, 
the series was handed over to Robert Kaniger with issue number two, who put less emphasis on Wonder Woman being a feminist icon and focused more on her being a stereotypical American hero. While the works of Kaniger received a mishmash of both criticism and praise from readers of all backgrounds, Wonder Woman also saw her stories being affected by the growing concern of comics' influence on young minds. Led by psychologist Frederick Wortham and various parents groups who linked comics to juvenile delinquency, unlike Batman who was viewed as glorifying crime through vigilantism, Frederick Wortham looked to Wonder Woman as a character with lesbian tendencies which in turn would only corrupt America's youth with what he deemed as impure urges. Because the claims of Wortham and those like him led to the formation of the Comics Code Authority as an alternative to governmental regulation, the censorship of the Comics Code resulted in Wonder Woman losing her identity as an independent woman in place of a stereotypical 1950s woman who spent much of her time pining over love Steve Trevor as well as several other male superheroes. And so because Wonder Woman's largest audience base was found in female readers who looked to a strong character of their own, where DC orchestrated the introduction of characters like Wonder Girl who would go on to become Donna Troy, as well as more prominent roles for female members of her family, much like Batman whose stories fell to the point of near cancellation, so too did Wonder Woman. While Superman number 75 would establish the heroes of DC's comics sharing the same Earth, allowing for crossovers between the titles, with Wonder Woman being unable to hold her own popularity amidst the newly redesigned and largely disliked incarnation, efforts were made to rework her character in a way that fell in line with the comics code, but also drew in those readers who had long abandoned the title. Coming under the control of writer Dennis O'Neill and artist Mike Zikowski with issue number 178, in issue number 179, the two had gone so far as to strip Wonder Woman of her powers entirely in an effort to make her more relatable to the reader base. Renaming the title to the new Wonder Woman and focusing on a powerless Diana continuing to operate as a hero using newly learned martial arts skills, the series was critically lambasted by both existing readers and feminist leaders alike who viewed the series as returning Wonder Woman to her position as a weak woman. Experiencing a revolving door of creators including Mike Sikowski becoming both writer and artist, as well as Samuel Delaney and Dick Giordano taking over the title, in the face of sales plummeting at a staggering rate, with issue number 204 in 1973, writer Robert Kaniger returned to the series where he restored Wonder Woman's powers and placed within the larger DC landscape. Covered in 2012's back issue number 61 from Two Morrows Publishing, with Warner Brothers' Wonder Woman TV show running strong and approaching its final season, Kaniger's initial strategy was to simply rewrite and redraw the same stories from Wonder Woman's Golden Age comics. While this was only a temporary measure in order to restore fan faith in the return of her character, between issues 212 and 222, DC initiated a storyline titled Wonder Woman The Twelve Labors, which depicted her undergoing 12 tests for the purpose of proving her worth to rejoin the team. Following this and going into the early 1980s, because the advent of DC's multiverse had already alienated prospective fans, following Crisis on Infinite Earths, Wonder Woman's character was rebooted yet again by writers George Perez, Len Wein, and Greg Potter in an effort to bring in new readers as well as tie into the tail end of second wave feminism during the late 1980s. Covered in the first and second issues of her solo series, Diana came to America not to help fight the spread of communism, but primarily on a mission for peace with a side mission to keep the Greek god of war Ares from destroying the world in a nuclear holocaust. With their first battle taking place in the middle of the streets in Boston, the various bystanders observing the conflict began to take notice of her amazing powers calling her Wonder Woman for the first time in the post-crisis continuity. Using her lasso of truth at the battle's conclusion, Diana was able to convince Ares that he's wrong for trying to destroy the world, after which she defeats him and returns home to Paradise Island, where the injuries she sustained in the battle are healed by Poseidon. Returning to Boston and hiring a publicist named Mindy Mayer to help her spread her image across the globe in the interest of learning more about man's world and becoming a global ambassador for peace, during her travels, she meets Superman and develops a crush on him. Considered by many to be a follow-up to the works of Robert Kaniger and the pre-crisis continuity during Wonder Woman's powerless days as part of the Lois vs. Diana plot threads, the concept of Wonder Woman replacing Lois as Clark's love interest was quickly nipped in the bud when the two go on a date and decide that they're better off as friends. Around the same time and as part of George Perez's efforts to reboot the character, issue number 7 saw the introduction of Cheetah. Operating as a mantle of sorts similar to Green Lantern or Captain America, where the first two incarnations of Cheetah existed in the pre-crisis continuity as Priscilla Rich and Deborah Domain respectively, these versions of the character saw the women dressing up in Cheetah costumes and functioning as villains for Wonder Woman. However, during the era of George Perez, the concept was revisited in that archaeologist Barbara Minerva physically transforms into a humanoid Cheetah, becoming one of Diana's most formidable villains. 
Conversely, George Perez began to use his time to bolster the Amazonian side of Diana's heritage while tying into both the Crisis on Infinite Earths event itself as well as the post-crisis landscape. Taking place in issue number 20 in 1988 titled Who Killed Mindy Mayer, stretching up through issue number 37 in 1990 titled Strangers in Paradise, in addition to Mindy's death by drug overdose, the Greek gods were considering leaving Olympus due to the damage it sustained at the hands of Darkseid during the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. While Wonder Woman helps the gods by destroying Olympus allowing them to move on with no strings attached, the result is that the Amazons were now able to decide for themselves whether or not to let humans onto Paradise Island. Holding a vote and after most of their number agrees, Diana invites her friends to visit Paradise Island. As a result, and as part of the larger picture, these dichotomies were designed to bolster the internal struggle of Diana Prince regarding her position as an Earthbound hero and her allegiance to her Amazonian heritage. In addition to this, with the post-crisis continuity seeing the Justice League team revamped as the Justice League International under Keith Giffen and J.M.D. Mateus, because the title had experienced a series of struggles regarding both publication sales and popularity going into the mid-1990s, in 1997, writer Grant Morrison relaunched the team and returned its core lineup, including Wonder Woman, Superman, and Batman. Keeping in line with George Perez's depiction of Wonder Woman as a strong warrior, Unlike other members of the Justice League, Wonder Woman was more open to using deadly force due to her Amazonian heritage and identity as a warrior princess. Where the JLA line allowed for Wonder Woman to flourish alongside her various teammates within her own solo series, the efforts of George Perez laid the groundwork for future writers in the post-crisis continuity including William Messner Loeb's and Mike Diordato, John Byrne who had Hippolyta take over the Wonder Woman mantle for a time, and Eric Luke, whose 25-issue run thrust Wonder Woman into an existential crisis where she not only questioned her place in a world of men, but also her existence as the world's most powerful woman. Continuing these themes, within the pages of Superman, Action Comics, Adventures of Superman, and Wonder Woman Volume 2 as part of Countdown to Final Crisis, writers Greg Rucka, Gail Simone, John Byrne, and others came together for the Wonder Woman Sacrifice storyline which saw her breaking her no-kill rule. Coming out of 1988's Invasion crossover by Bill Mantlo which centered on an alien force invading the Earth, during the battle, a gene bomb was detonated which activated metahuman powers in a portion of humanity. Finding himself with the ability to control the minds of others, former businessman and Justice League International leader Maxwell Lord used his powers to seize control of Superman as part of his larger scheme for world domination. Escaping the Man of Steel and confronting Maxwell Lord head on, after using her lasso of truth, Wonder Woman is informed that the only way Max will allow Superman to go is for Wonder Woman to kill him. Granting his request and breaking his neck, her actions are observed by Brother Eye, the satellite designed by Batman to monitor all superhuman activity, which was then broadcast worldwide, destroying Wonder Woman's credibility and shattering her friendship with the rest of the League. That said, while the post-Infinite Crisis stories of one year later and the year-long event 52 would attempt to flesh out confusing aspects of her world including her relationship to Donna Troy, in the years leading up to the start of the New 52, Wonder Woman experienced a series of waxes and wanes under the writing of Alan Heinberg, Jody Picoult, and James Robinson, all of which was met with mediocre response owing in part to delayed releases and confusing plot lines. As a result, and without much outcry barring the most hardcore fans, Wonder Woman was slated for a complete reboot following the conclusion of the Flashpoint event going into the New 52. That said, in the early issues of New 52's Wonder Woman title written by Brian Azzarello and drawn by Cliff Chang, Diana was put in charge of protecting a woman named Zola who became pregnant by Zeus and was kidnapped by Hades. A major theme of this line involves Diana's discovery of her own origins when she comes into contact with a villain called Strife, a take on the Greek goddess of discord, leading into Wonder Woman's subsequent quest to find her other half-siblings. While the events of these early issues would reveal that Zeus had spawned a litany of children out of wedlock, with his wife Hera on a mission to kill all of them, one of these children and Diana's older half-brother is revealed to be Lennox Sandsmark, the father of Cassie Sandsmark, also known as Wonder Girl, who is one of the founding members of the Teen Titans in the New 52. This line of storytelling also sees Wonder Woman learning more about her Amazonian brothers when she finds out that for centuries, Amazonian women had occasionally invaded ships and forced themselves on the male sailors in order to impregnate themselves, after which they kept the female children but tried to kill the males by drowning them. Where the Greek god Hephaestus intervened by making a deal to give weapons to the Amazons in exchange for allowing the boys to live, these themes were expanded on during Wonder Woman issue number zero. However, the largest and perhaps most important concept of her character came in that unlike the pre-New 52 continuity, Clark Kent had not found himself in a relationship with Lois. While the two weren't necessarily enemies, the idea of a romance between the two never saw its fruition. 
Instead, Wonder Woman was injected as the most reasonable candidate for romance due to her ability to keep up with Clark, both mentally and physically. While this revelation came to the chagrin of traditional Superman fans who preferred the stories of old, the now famous issue of Justice League issue number 12 written by Jeff Johns and drawn by Jim Lee spurred a social media buzz with the depiction of Wonder Woman and Superman coming together in the New 52. However, while fans initially looked to the New 52 Wonder Woman title as one of the best series released under the initiative, whether it came by way of weak storytelling or a lack of credibility, readership ultimately fell off to the point that the series began to fall down the ranks in sales. To this end, and as part of the DC Rebirth initiative, fans anticipated the release of Wonder Woman Rebirth No. 1, which would see her character return to their preferred standard using a combination of both pre-New 52 and New 52 information. With that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.